Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Emery and I'm from, hey, um, I'm from Wellington, New Zealand, and I'm here to talk to you today about Reality Composer, which is an app Apple introduced this year at WWDC um, that allows people to create meaningful AR experiences with no code. Um, so who am I? I'm a student at Massey University in Wellington, New Zealand. I'm also a freelance designer and front-end developer and build sites with Webflow. Does anyone know of Webflow? Yep. Woo! Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm also working on an app called Road Trip, um, which allows Kiwis to find fuel prices based on a um, cool API we've got in New Zealand based on license plates. So you input your start, um, end, and your license plate, and it figures out how much fuel will cost. Not in Australia yet, sorry. Um, but I was also, like Tony mentioned, a WWDC scholar this year, along with Zach. Um, and we both got the AUC scholarship, so thank you so much to AUC for providing that. It was awesome. And it was a great WWDC to attend, I hear, um, for my first one. Um, so why am I interested in augmented reality? Um, to be honest, when augmented reality first started happening with things like Pokemon Go, um, to say the least, it wasn't a very compelling demo for me for mainstream adoption. Um, it was the first mainstream AR app, but it didn't show me the potential that AR was really going to take off. Um, that was until Apple released ARKit, and you started seeing demos on Twitter that kind of showed, oh, this could actually be something that mainstream people start using. And it wasn't until last year that some things started getting interesting. But what I realized um, was kind of the most magical experiences from technology come from when the technology is invisible. And that's kind of what shifted my perception of AR. Um, things like FaceTime were one of the most, um, you know, when, when FaceTime and Skype launched, they really made... Uh, made it appear that the technology was invisible. You don't have to think about H.264 encoding or networking requests. The technology gets out of the way and you can just focus on the experience. And AR, some of the mo more recent demos I've tried have really felt like that to me. Um, but the real reason I'm interested in augmented reality since this year is I designed a coffee machine as part of a university project. And throughout that process, we made 3D models with a program called um, Autodesk Fusion 360. And this was one of the early um, 3D models. Um, and what's great about that was that um, to develop them, they were really high detail, and they um, were really quick to make. So we could have like the bevel radiuses, the colors, try out different colors and textures and stuff. Um, but unfortunately, there was no way to see them full size. You kind of just had to see them on your laptop screen. Um, but we also did physical models, as um, any good industrial design class would do. Um, and they were life-size. They had real materiality. Um, but they were really low detail, um, as you can see. And they took a really long time to make. But the great thing about them was that they kind of showed um, you could put a coffee cup up next to them and really see how that actually um, scales in real life. So being the nerd I was, I thought, there's got to be a best of both worlds scenario here, um, where we can get high detail, quick to make, life-size, and real materiality all in one. Take the best of both worlds from the 3D models and the physical models. And luckily for me, there was with augmented reality. Um, so this was one of the very crude early demos I did with augmented reality and trying when I was building the coffee machine to test out scale and kind of see how big things would be and put up a coffee cup next to it and put my hand next to it and see how big it might actually be in real life. Um, and it was also seriously cool. Um, but there was a lot of Totally a lot of downsides last year. Um, so to create the USDZ files, you had to use an Xcode command line interface. Um, and that's something that I could do. But when I showed other people who were making coffee machines in my class, it was totally inaccessible to them. They, they didn't know how to do it. So it was um, really hard. And there was also a, a real lack of documentation last year. Um, and the textures were really bad, um, as you could see in that last demo. Um, and this was kind of the creation workflow that we had last year. Um, you'd create an OBJ file. You'd find texture images online, so things like, I don't know, this yellow brick. Um, but most for, most for the most part, I just used colors, like you saw in the last demo. And then you kind of had to figure out the region names of each section of the model. So obviously, for the base, you wanted it to be yellow. But for the glass, you wanted it to be see-through or translucent. So um, you kind of had to figure that out with code and apply that with the command line interface. Um, but then, after you did all that hard work, you got a cool USDZ um, AR asset at the end of it, which you could show your friends and kind of see, play with scale, et cetera. Um, and first of all, for anyone who doesn't know, a USDZ is basically Apple and um, Pixar's uh, open source file format for 3D. Um, and this is kind of like an example that Maya made. 
that kind of shows how the textures work. So basically, on the left is the file um, of the, the or the model, and the model has the textures on the right that are applied to it. So um, kind of to make these textures work, you kind of have to skin the model. Um, so a person was a great uh, example of skinning the person, lying out the skin flat, and then painting over the skin. Um, so that's kind of like a good example of how to show how it actually works. You can see the face there all skinned um, and applied textures to. And then they all kind of come together in the computer to make that um, the real model on the left. Um, and a USDZ is basically um, just got really, really great um, textures and lighting um, diffusions and stuff like that. Um, great shading qualities. And yeah, they use the PBR texture maps. Um, so they're just a great file format that Pixar has been developing for like 30 years. And if anyone was in the Mac Pro demo room this year, um, Pixar and Apple actually showed off Toy Story 4, which was the entire set of Toy Story 4 made with USDZ assets for the first time in a movie. Um, and the reason Pixar developed the format, and I was told they'd been developing it for over 30 years, was because um, they wanted to be able to have multiple 3D artists working on the same scene at the same time. So it would allow one person to composite the scene of where the items are placed, and then one other person to basically work on the detailing of each object at the same time. Um, which surprisingly wasn't a thing before this. Um, but USDZ is obviously also for augmented reality. And um, last year, with iOS 12, they introduced AR Quick Look, which is basically something where you can open a USDZ asset. Um, it opens on the iPhone like this. You can see the AR and the object. So you can see kind of an object view um, before you put the object into augmented reality. And it works on iPhone success and above. Um, so this is kind of like a demo of what the USDZs kind of look like. Um, the only thing about them, as you can see, they had like some animations here, but they were static. And um, it would have been cool if the plane could actually take off rather than just sit there taxiing. Um, and Apple kind of like uh, realized this, I think. And this year, that all kind of changes. So there's a much, much better asset um, workflow creation, much better asset creation workflow. Um, there's a brand new Apple AR prototyping app, Reality Composer. Um, and there's a brand new Apple AR file format different from USDZ. Um, and this is the new AR creation workflow. You start with a model, same as you did before. You then texture it with a much easier um, graphic user interface um, with drag and drop. You then apply interactions and make it do stuff rather than just be a static object. And then you can deploy it and just start showing people. So I want to take us through the um, AR creation workflow because this is something it's really hard to find online documentation about good workflows. Um, and this is something I talked to Apple about, about what was the best. Um, so basically, you start with creating a 3D model, same as, any, same as the old way. Um, you just need an OBJ or an FBX file. Um, and I did my coffee machine model with Autodesk Fusion 360, as I said. Um, you can also just scan the objects, which is quite cool. If you've got a 3D scanner, you walk around the object and it makes a model. Um, or you can download something online and modify it. But from there, you put it into an app called Substance Painter, which has um, just recently been acquired by Adobe. And it's basically Photoshop for 3D objects. Um, so you import your OBJ or FBX file. You can texture it using drag and drop. So you can you know, drag and drop. Um, and then you can export. This, this is the part that's new since DubDub. Is, uh, you can export them straight as USDZ assets, which means you don't have to use the command line interface at all. It's straight native. And um, Apple was really happy about that. Um, and then this is the big thing that uh, the really big part about AR creation workflow this year is Reality Composer, which is what I call the best AR prototyping tool. So to start, you import your USDZ assets, you apply interactions to them, you can quickly prototype an AR. So you, while you're prototyping, while you're creating the asset um, interactions, you can actually do that in augmented reality. You can export it as reality, and there's no code. Um, it's also a Mac and iOS app. So you can start on the Mac and finish on the iOS version. And to do Reality Composer, you basically choose an anchor. And this is where the first of the fun starts happening. Um, with USDZ assets, um, you could only choose between horizontal or vertical um, last year. So it means you could put something on the floor or on the wall. But um, in ARKit, there's actually the ability to put things on images. So you could have an AR object follow this image. You could apply them to objects. And since the true depth camera, you can apply them to faces. So Reality Composer unlocks all of that and doesn't allow you to do any, or means that you don't have to write any code. 
Um, from there, you import the USDZ object. So for me, it's the coffee machine. And then from there, you can kind of um, add gravity and weight, change sizes, add force to it. And um, Apple has a built-in uh, USDZ library. So for me, I imported a cup so that you could kind of see the scale of the cup there with it. Um, and then you can kind of change the color of the cup, et cetera. Um, but here's where the fun really starts happening is with the interactions. So it's kind of actually like Siri shortcuts. You can basically, if this, then that coding um, style, you say, for instance, press the button and something starts happening. Um, and so it has also built-in actions like Keynote, and um, you can play sounds and even notify Xcode. Um, and there's tons of, tons of, absolutely tons of stuff that you can do, like force, gravity, collision triggers, notify Xcode, and take in requests from Xcode. But from there, you then export the reality file. So this is an example of the real coffee machine and my coffee machine next to it. Um, and it has a real physics engine, um, and like I said, support for all the interactions that I mentioned before. Um, and this is kind of a rundown of the differences between the USDZ file format and reality format. Um, so there's much more advanced animations, more custom powerful interactions. So for the plane example, you can actually imagine coming up and tapping the plane and it starts taking off. Um, and there's tons, tons more stuff. So reality file is hands down a better file format than USDZ, but it is Apple proprietary. Um, whereas USDZ was technically open source, but... Mm. Um, and to, then to deploy the asset, you can either deploy it on the web. So for me, I've got it at um, emory.co.nz slash coffee. You can go out and try it yourself. Um, and it works with USDZ and reality file format. And it opens an AR quick look. Um, and it's as, as, as easy as embedding a link or an image to a website. You just have to have the rel attribute as AR. Um, but you can also embed reality files in your app. So you basically drag them into your Xcode project. Xcode, Xcode imports all the objects and assets for you as lines of code. And then you can start moving the objects with code. Um, so not, not just move, but also change text. So if you have any text, you can dynamically change that in your app. Um, and you can send and receive triggers for interaction. So say, for instance, you have a trigger when two objects collide. You can then have the phone vibrate or pull up a modal or something like that. Um, and if anyone saw this demo at WWC, Apple actually had an example of a reality file working, showing off their $6,000 monitor, um, where you could kind of like see the different layers and um, see how cool it was, how worth the money it was, and, uh, and kind of like get a, get a better idea of like what's going on under the hood, I guess. Um, but it was just a cool demo, and I thought, wow, that's, it's actually really cool for being able to kind of see the... Um, get a better idea of how it might work. And also, they had, of course, the example of just trying it in your space. But this was cool because it was a bit more dynamic and you could actually see what's going on. Um, so from there, I kind of wanted to do the same thing with my coffee machine. And I thought, um, what could I do to basically make the experience not just static, but also move around as people interact with it? Um, so this is kind of what the coffee machine looks like in augmented reality. Um, and as you can see, it's just static. It doesn't have any movement. Um, and this is an example of what a USDZ asset might look like. But then with Reality Composer, as you get close to the object, the lid can slide off, for example. Um, and this is totally no code. This is an example of um, cheesy little flip animation that uh, Reality Composer has built in. And then the audio is not coming through, but when you tap the button, it'll actually fill up the cup with coffee. <laughs> And then you can move the tray out and see how it might look like in your space and how much space you might need to put in front of the coffee machine, et cetera. Just a cool little demo that I thought um, it's pretty awesome to be able to do with Reality Composer. Um, but you may be wondering, how is this relevant to me and my app? I don't have anything augmented reality um, yet. Well, coming back to that um, fact that the most magical experiences, to me, come from when the technology is most invisible. Um, I've kind of collated a couple examples of how AR can actually make an experience more magical, not in the ways that you might think. Um, and yeah, that's the question. Can AR make your app more magical? It doesn't always, but there's a chance that it might. Um, so this is a demo I found on Twitter, which basically allows you to 
wave your phone in front of uh, foreign currency and then it adds, tallies all the foreign, foreign currency together with like an ML object detector as well. And um, yeah, I'll just play it. Um, so basically you can wave your phone over the top, it counts up the currency, and down here you've got a tally of how much it all costs. Um, so for me that was a really cool example of um, kind of like inputting data without actually having to start typing on your phone. Another great example of that is, for instance, walking into a bookstore, waving your phone in front of the book and having the reviews come up just overlaid over the top of the book. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, pretty dynamic. Um, so that, <laughs> really shaking it. Um, another great example is for data visualization. So if your app does anything data visualization, um, for instance, Slopes um, does basically ski tracking, and after you finish your skiing, it can show you in augmented reality where you kind of went down the mountain, how fast you were going at different points. Um, and there's really good examples for like, say, you work at, I don't know, Canva or something. You could basically um, take, the, take what the person's designed and show them what it might look like printed out in real life. Um, so there's kind of great things for data visualization, visualization there. Um, this is a really cool app, uh, demo I found online um, for education. So this is kind of like, um, uh, chemistry and showing how like atoms combine to create elements. Um, and this is actually, you can do this in Reality Composer. All of the demos that I've showed you can do in Reality Composer. Um, and then kind of the element changes into the blob of uh, H2O. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see how it's really uh, good for like young children to start learning with visual, they're more visual learners so it's really cool to be able to um, experience stuff in augmented reality like that. And it's a really untapped area of augmented reality so far. Um, obviously, the big one um, that has probably had the most attention so far has been gaming. So uh, Pokemon Go is the obvious big one. And then Minecraft Earth, as they demoed on stage this year, um, another really big, uh, hard to pass over area of augmented reality. Um, but the big one I want to talk about is e-commerce. And I think this is the place that AR has definitely the most potential to be really impactful. Um, and for a mainstream audience who are buying more and more things online, it's starting to get kind of um, interesting to think about what an online shopping experience would be like in AR. And Shopify is actually hiring 3D artists, um, basically connecting 3D artists with people who have online stores selling physical goods for them to be able to ship you the real life product, you can digitally mock it up and then send it back to them and then have the AR object on your online store. Um, like kind of they showed on stage, Craig showing the um, guitar, if anyone remembers that. Um, and this was one of the first examples that they showed off last year. Everyone's probably seen this, but it's IKEA Place app, which allows you to place furniture in your space. And this was kind of the one that made me think, uh, AR is not a gimmick, this is actually real. Um, and I used it when I was moving into my new place to see if my bed would fit, and it worked really well. Um, so yeah, you can kind of place furniture in there and you avoid situations like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for real, it does, it does show that like, you don't have to start measuring stuff anymore. You can actually do it with augmented reality, and it's a real world use case. Um, another great example I found online uh, is Wanna Kicks, which is an app that allows you to try on shoes in augmented reality. Um, it also uses ML to be able to detect the feet, since Apple doesn't have an API for that. Um, but basically you can kind of, it really shows how rather than going into a shoe store and taking off the shoe each time, you can kind of even do this in the comfort of your own home and try on different colors um, straight in augmented reality. And every time I show people this in real life, they are totally stunned. Uh, it's really, really impressive, and it works really well with socks on. Um, and YouTube is actually rolling out try-on makeup in uh, YouTube, which allows beauty uh, YouTubers to basically show what lipstick might look like on you and your um, complexion, et cetera. Um, you can try on all the different palettes or whatever, and then you can buy straight in the app, um, which is obviously another really cool use case. Um, so I actually thought of making a demo this year that would show off the um, amazing potential of Reality Composer and um, that revolves around the face augmentation. So you can apply things to faces, anchors on faces. Um, and that is 
try on sunglasses. So this is a real example I made um, online, and if you're running iOS 13, you can visit it at emory.co.nz slash sunglasses. But basically, um, it allows you to scroll down the page, see sunglasses that you like, and then tap into augmented reality, the asset loads, working on my talk there. Um, and then, yeah, you can start trying on sunglasses in augmented reality. Um, and that's actually one that I built using uh, Blender and Substance Painter and Reality Composer. And this was not possible before last year, before Apple introduced Reality Composer. So it poses some really cool um, kind of real world use cases for online shopping. Um, so to end, I just want to say, uh, you, the two th main use cases I've found for Reality Composer in my two months of using it. Um, it unlocks a whole new range of possibilities for e-commerce. So rather than having something as a static object, you can really um, have more dynamic um, elements about it. So another use case they showed off was, say you're buying a bike online and you want to go and see the details of each individual component on the bike, um, you can do that. And it also allows you to um, have a, a straight call to action buy button in the AR view this year um, is brand new. So they're really pushing AR as an e-commerce platform um, quite heavily at the moment. But it's also the best AR prototyping tool. Um, and if you've been meaning to try out augmented reality but haven't had the time to basically learn the documentation or anything like that, you kind of have no more excuses. It's really, really solid um, tooling this year. And um, it means you don't have to learn any code. Um, but the thing I want to leave you on today is what does your app look like in a world after the iPhone um, when we might have different form factors of uh, using our devices? Um, is it just a static 2D screen, or does it have more dynamic elements and more real-world objects? Um, and Reality Composer is the best way to start answering that question. Yeah, so thank you. Um, and all of the, oh, yeah, <laughs> clap. <laughs> Everything um, on there, including my slides and even more uh, links and demos, are on my website um, under DevWorld. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>